On this Debaco University video, I'm going to go through an in-depth as well as a field look at anthocyanins. So I'm going to give you an anthocyanin overview. Uh, I'll also look at genetic regulation and field observations of cannabis. Hopefully you enjoy. So first off, to give you a little bit of the progression of information you're going to find in this video, I'm going to go over basically what are anthocyanins and provide you a basic background. Also, the regulation of anthocyanin biosynthesis, which gets into some new insight into gene regulation at the molecular scale. And then we'll go out in the field for an early season and mid-season plant response to environmental stresses that cause it to increase anthocyanin production. It's going to be a macroscopic view of how most growers will see or recognize anthocyanins. I'll provide you with an uh, outfield uh, look at some recently transplanted um, cannabis plants and care will provide you with a late vegetative uh, growth um, anthocyanin look. So first off, let's start with the basics. And these basics always I mean, here on Debak University try to be science-based. So here is an article uh, you can take a look at if you want to learn, learn more about anthocyanins and there'll be another one referred to as well in this video. So first off, again, what are those anthocyanins? This is kind of what they look like on a chemical structure. But anthocyanins are colored water-soluble pigments, which are a class of flavonoids, in part uh, pigmentation of the plant parts, and play an important roles in plant environmental interactions. These components uh, and compounds can also have medical benefits as well. You see a couple of them kind of listed here. And again, these are found more than just in cannabis plants, blueberries, as well as other fruits and vegetables can express these um, as well. So again, there's just also more than one anthocyanin. Um, blueberries contain five out of the six. Uh, they're just missing one there. Each has a different coloration. However, the color is influenced by the pH, light, temperature, and also the structure. In general, though, anthocyanins are red in acidic conditions and blue when the pH is increased. To give you an idea of the general pH, you can see all have a very similar structure. But again, some of them are uh, pH dependent, can actually be used as an indicator. So that color changing complexities here, color changes in response to pH uh, variation of you know, the anthocyanins. This can be used as a pH indicator and actually extracted from red cabbage. Actually, if you take red cabbage and put it in a blender and uh, take some of that uh, water um, out and then you add different pHs, it'll actually change color right before your eyes and can, based on what color you see, can indicate what pH. If you put it in an acidic solution, it'll turn more of the pinkish reddish hues. If you put it more in a slightly basic, it'll be more of the purple. If you put it in a more extreme basic, it'll be more of a yellow coloration. So fun experiment if you wanted to try it. Just get some red cabbage in a blender and uh, some degrees of acids and bases. You can literally see the color change um, as an indicator. Uh, with anthocyanins, they also have something called copigmentation. So copigmentation helps to stabilize the color of the leaves, flowers, and fruits of the plant. This increased color intensity can be due to the copigmentation of anthocyanins and the flavonoids. Here's a little bit more of the detail here of copigmentation. Uh, there's metal ions that bind the B ring of the anthocyanins. In this case, aluminum binding changes the anthocyanins from a red to blue color. So there is some degree of complexity that can be associated with this. Here we see a low anthocyanin and a high anthocyanin production. This is typically how growers are going to recognize it by simply the degree of purple that they may see expressed in their plants. Now, high temperature can also influence the plant. So anthocyanins are less stable at higher solution temperatures in the plant. A previous study, the one I just showed you, uh, reports a heat treatment at a maximum of 35 degrees Celsius reduced the total anthocyanin content in the common grape to less than half the amount in control berries that were kept at 25 degrees Celsius. So again, we're talking about stability of things. Anthocyanins kind of if you increase the temperature too much you can have that reduction um, there in total concentration. Now, heat and anthocyanins in the extract solution. So if we're looking at these, heat um, treatment of an anthocyanin in a rich extract solution may not cause a degradation of anthocyanin pigments. So it's important here that we're looking at now the extract of the solution here. This is because the extract commonly contains uh, phenolic compounds that are enzymatically degraded by phenyl oxidase. So in this example, mild heat um, of the extract uh, to up to 50 degrees Celsius has been shown to inactivate the enzymatic reaction. 
Without the denaturing of the enzyme, the anthocyanin can be preserved despite the increase in temperature. So this is because if the anthocyanins are being broken down by an enzyme, if that enzyme has the wrong shape and it can't perform its function, therefore it's denatured, well, because the enzyme can no longer break down the anthocyanin, they can be exposed to greater temperatures. So that's kind of like an interesting fact there when we're talking about the extract compared to the actual in the plant content. Now when we're looking at extracting anthocyanins, this can get quite complicated um, here, but organic solvents, typically methanol and ethanol, are considered as generally safe extraction medium. Isolation of anthocyanins using water-based extraction though is a lex toxic procedure and when it's being implemented a little bit more frequently. This subcritical water-based extraction uses acidified water uh, with uh, hydrochloric acid to a pH of about um, 2.3 that is subject to high temperatures. When I say high temperatures, we're looking at between 110 and 160 degrees Celsius under a constant pressure of 40 bars. This is a highly effective technique for extracting anthocyanins from fruit. And you can see it does require some equipment, but really offers the greatest um, extraction percentage of this particular compound. Now, separation of anthocyanins. Well, anthocyanins are extracted from plants as a crude mixture. For that reason, separation or isolation of specific types of anthocyanin is needed for a specific purpose. Separation and identification of anthocyanins can be done vi via various uh, chromatic uh, methods here. So just kind of an example here, HPLC, high pressure liquid chromatography, um, liquid chromatography mass spec, uh, NMR, um, nuclear magnetic re resonance. There's a lot of different methods and that kind of will depend what you might be looking at separating or what degree of specificity you might need, whether it's a qualitative or a quantitative um, method as well. Now getting in more into the biosynthesis, so if you want to learn a little bit more about the uh, gene regulation here, this is a relatively new published article that just came out, uh, really gets into some of the details, uh, maybe not for the, you know, the grower morpholo morphological macroscopic view, but really this is kind of a breakthrough that's going to help us out uh, with the biogene regulation of anthocyanin production. So transcription factors, uh, the molecular basis of anthocyanin biosynthesis and cannabis sativa remains elusive. However, for this reason, research still provides information regarding the regulatory genes of anthocyanin biosynthesis. This will be useful for biotechnological improvement. So even though this is just kind of like a little bit of a glimpse, a little bit of an insight, um, this could potentially be the research that perpetuates uh, this going forward. So why do we want to look at a transcription factor? Um, transcription factors, and what are transcription factors? They're basically proteins involved in the process of converting or transcribing DNA into RNA. So we have genetic codes in our genes, and then those DNA goes to RNA, and that RNA is a messenger RNA that will then get made into a protein. So transcription factors include a wide number of proteins, excluding RNA polymerase that initiate and regulate the transcription of genes. And there's a really simple way to think about it. You can think about it as it's an on-off switch. Transcription factor determines whether that gene is made or that protein is produced or whether that is turned off there. Um, and again, it occurs at the molecular level, but it's a simple on-off. Transcription factor, yes, make that protein, or no, do not make that protein. So why look at transcription factors? Uh, well, they're important for gene regulation and also cell signaling. One distinct feature of transcription factors is that they have DNA binding domains that give them the ability to bind to specific sequences of DNA called enhancer or promoter sequences. Again, that promoter region would be the area that could be the light switch turned on or turned off. As a result, this will have a direct impact on the expression or the suppression of this particular gene. So we see here if there's an enhancer, it's going to allow this to kind of go through and progress and allow that uh, protein to be made. Or if there's a silencer or a suppressor that's going to prevent that or stop that, act as a wall, a barrier, turn that off. Now, our bodies don't want to make everything all the time, so this, this is important to have this regulation, but here we're looking at it specifically for this anthocyanin uh, a biosynthesis process. So within that, there is the um, MYB family for, of transcription factors, the MYB uh, transcription factors, abbreviated TFs if I use that, um, preceding, uh, pre preceding this, as one of the largest gene families in plants. It gets its name from the myoblast, um, came from the first identification of these, which was in avian oncogenes. 
interesting uh, background there. 203 identified MYB family transcription factors um, have been found in eukaryotes. Now they do play important roles in biological processes well beyond what we're going to look at here, including uh, plant growth, plant uh, cell morphology, pattern building, physiological activity, primary and secondary metabolite reactors, responses to environmental stresses, you can see involved in a lot. This family of transcription factors plays a vital role in regulating anthocyanin biosynthesis as well. In fact, 99 R2, R3, MYB genes have been identified in the cannabis sativa genome alone. Here we're looking at an example here of a Arabidopsis, but we're looking now at this article really making it more specific to the cannabis sativa plant. So what are these R2, R3, MYB genes? Why are they, you know, why are we looking at them? Um, and this is other previous researchers did confirm um, that the ESMYBF1 as a flavonoid specific regulator, which participate in the biosynthesis regulation of the flavonoid derived bioactive components. Now, this is looking at kind of that genetics, which I know can be um, look a little confusing if you're not used to looking at charts like this, but just think of this as a genetic sequences. You're looking at the genes or the coding, the recipes to make certain proteins. So these uh, transcription factors are widely involved in the secondary metabolites of organic acids in medicinal plants. And it's been found that these R2, R3, MYB uh, transcription factors of the fourth subfamily are involved in metabolism of the phenylperinoid as a negative regulator in various medicinal plants. What does this mean? Well, in, in short, we're looking at, we're in that gene regulation. We can choose to upregulate or downregulate certain genes, and now we've kind of identified that marker uh, according to this published study. So anthocyanins regulators are identified based on the phenology as well as the expression profiling of genes in two um, areas here of the cannabis sativa, differing in the content of anthocyanin pigmentation in the sugar leaves, two punitive regulations of anthocyanin biosynthesis, named as a CSMYB33 and CSMYB78 were identified. So again, we're identifying specific regions within the cannabis plant based on this research. So that can really be utilized now to start to target or look for certain sequences. We can definitely see that image B has more of that purple anthocyanin um, upregulation up than does uh, plant A here. So they looked at similar plant. So they were looking at the transit overexpression of these in um, leaves of um, a close relative of tobacco. And as comparison, it was found that there was a stronger in terms of activation of the anthocyanin biosynthesis. So we're looking at the certain genes, looking at a, you know, a cross comparison here, developing that um, uh, analog there for comparison. We're definitely seeing this in derivatives of cultivated tobacco, seeing that increased expression. I think just on the pictures alone, you can see that higher degree of purple coloration. That enhanced anthocyanin pigmentation in the leaves as well as the sepals, the transgenic lines there. So we're able to modify those genes and we are seeing that proof of concept with that increased purple coloration. So uh, this is a start. So it's great information, but there is still limited knowledge about the structural and functional attributes of the R2, R3, MYBs in cannabis sativa. We can see that they are found in other plants as well. But we're trying to understand specifically in the cannabis plant. So I know there's a lot of background information there. So how does this actually help a grower? Uh, after this in-depth investigation about anthocyanins, and hopefully you've tuned in this long, most growers recognize this as a purple coloration to their plants. Often this is a result of an environmental stress. I'm going to show you two examples of this plant response. I'm going to be out in the field early season showing you plant shock, showing increased anthocyanin pigmentation in the main stem of recently transplanted seedlings. And Kara is going to show us increased anthocyanin production on leaf petioles, indicated right here, due to a sudden increase in light exposure due to the removal of a nearby uh, plant's shading. So hopefully you've enjoyed this kind of like background look, detailed gen new genetic look, and now let's go out in the field where we can also see this comparison of different plants with different anthocyanin levels of production. Now many growers may think this is a phosphorus deficiency when they first look at it because they're seeing the purple coloration of the stem and also the leaves here. But this just may be simple transplant shock. The plant's about two weeks in the ground here, and you can see that knowing the soil test, has uh, an adequate amount of phosphorus. So a lot of times it gets misdiagnosed as a phosphorus deficiency, when in actuality this might be simply a stress. 
reason why I continue to say that, if you look at some of the newer growth towards the top here, you're noticing that it's green. And yes, there is some still stress kind of towards the edge, but it's a way the plant can produce what's called anthocyanins. Those anthocyanins shade it uh, from the sun because it is out here in the middle of the field. So this might be just a perfect example of a little plant stress that is not a nutrient deficiency at all. So today we're outside investigating this purpling on one of our cannabis plant stalks. The reason that this had occurred in the first place is that right where the camera was, there used to be a much taller cannabis plant growing, providing constant shade to this side of the plant. But suddenly because of bunny damage, it got taken down. So in result, this plant received much more light on this side than it was typically used to, resulting in this purpling pigment. It's like a sunburn, but for a plant. And you could tell it's a sunburn because it doesn't occur on the other side. It's just where the light hits the stem that it has this purple pigmentation. The anthocyanin come out and create this purple pigment. And that's what causes sometimes purpling within the stems of your cannabis plant.